And these are in listen-only mode. Hey folks, Pat Flynn, Sam Sikdar here. Uh, honored to announce that we're sitting down with Dan John for our, oh boy, what is this, our third or fourth Ask Dan John webinar. These are always a, a ton of fun. Um, everybody always learns a ton of information. Um, you know, so we're always super excited and honored that Dan has taken the time to sit down and do these webinars with us. Uh, we have a ton of questions to get through. We're going to try and go for about an hour. So here's, here's the rules before I let Dan introduce uh, and talk about himself a little bit. Um, anybody that is on here live, uh, we really want you to ask questions. So uh, that little chat box you see down there, be sure to drop your questions in as you go. Uh, we have um, at least one copy of Dan's new book, Intervention, that we want to give out. So if you want a chance to win that book, then ask, uh, ask a really good question, and, uh, and we would be happy to give you a copy of his new intervention book. If you don't already have it, uh, shame on you if that is the case. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, let's, let's, you know, first talk about Dan. Uh, in case somebody stumbled on here not knowing who you are, I can't imagine why. Can you sort of just briefly sort of talk about yourself, what it is that you do, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Well, that's always a tough question. You know, I kind of have my foot in two worlds, academics and athletics, and uh, um, you know, I always tell people I was a Fulbright scholar, but it's an interesting thing is I got some news recently. It's not official yet, but it's close enough that I'll be put in the Sports Hall of Fame at one of the schools I went to. So I'm not sure how many people have ever been a Fulbright scholar and in a Sports Hall of Fame. So that's kind of a cool thing. Very cool. Um, grew, up, uh, grew up in South San Francisco, youngest of six. And, uh, oh, I was undersized because I was the youngest kid in the class and uh, discovered weightlifting. And weightlifting and the coaches, my mentors, uh, changed my life. Uh, my entire education only cost $10 because they couldn't waive the health fee. And uh, it's a very good education. And all because I could throw stuff far. And uh -huh. so I always feel like uh, I have a great debt to, um, you know, s strength, fitness, health, athletics. And so I try real hard to, to really try to pay that back, that, that karmic debt load, if you will, um, before I leave this fine earth. I'm trying to... Uh, you know, uh, right now I'm, I'm in the middle of writing another book. Uh, I'm, I, I don't have many weekends free because I do workshops nearly every weekend. This weekend I have free, but I'm going to the state weightlifting meet, which is kind of interesting because it's the, it's, it's the 34th annual state weightlifting meet. And in the first one, I got best lifter. So I've been trying to go as often as I could. So that's kind of what I do. I'm a volunteer throws coach at a local NAIA school. Uh, which is kind of funny because the, I get athletes from the Pac-12 schools that are in the neighborhood, and I won't mention which one it is, uh, and I get a bunch of other throwers who just show up and train with me. So it's kind of nice. I'm, you know, I'm trying to, you know, so volunteer strength coach, uh, volunteer throws coach, uh, writer, college professor, religious studies, dad, going to be a grandpa pretty soon. I got it going on. I mean, that's quite the the, uh, the life resume, I have to say, and, uh, you know, I know that you have left out quite a few considerable details, but I'm sure we'll get to those as we go along here. Um, I'm also very excited to announce that we are having Dan down for Strength Fest 2013. Uh, Dan will be running his full intervention workshop down at our place, so before we begin, Dan, can you just sort of talk to us briefly about what goes on at your intervention workshop, what people could expect when they come down to Strength Fest? Well, sure. Um... The thing is, we do go over, we go over the, the questions of the, you know, the, the five, well, in the book there's ten questions, but in the workshop we just walk through, again, the first five questions, you know, like what is your goal and how old you are, and it sounds like that will only take about a minute or so, but I really I try to pound away on the importance, and then uh, in the book there's five principles, but in the workshop I, I kind of now move those into three principles. They're the same, I just kind of cut it back for clarity, and then I walk, and then uh, in, the, in the afternoon session, I would walk you through a, a, a way to program like an elite athlete, but at the same time, I, how, how you would train Edna, your grandmother, you know, so that, you know, kind of at the same time. Uh, so basically, uh, the first part of the day will be a little bit of demonstration, just, I mean, just, just on the side. The afternoon will be a, maybe a workout, but it's, I, I don't ever... 
I believe in training sessions, never workouts, you know. And I hate it. I feel bad when people just get beat up at these workshops, you know, punched in the face by the, uh, you know, guys like me. And, <laughs> and you come away just tired, but you don't learn anything. You know what I'm saying? If I work you out three times a day at a workshop, you'll go home tired and sore. But on Monday, you won't be able to, what are you going to do, beat up all your clients on Monday with the workout we did on Saturday? It's, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. I'd rather give you uh, uh, some new tools, some new insights, maybe a new uh, paradigm of how you should train people. And that's kind of what the workshop will be about. It's funny. It's, uh, um, it, it can be a five-day workshop. It can be a one-day workshop. It can be you know, a 20-minute presentation. I, but I, I like it when I have a little, like, like eight hours or whatever we're going to do, is it, what I remember the time is. That's what I like best, when, you, when we can kind of get through it. The funny thing is, it's not the day of the workshop. It'll be like a week or two later you'll go, oh, Oh, you know, because you know, here I am, 55, and I just I'm going to do this Olympic lifting meet. So you're my new trainer. So you read this article how the the uh, Iranian super heavyweight train. You expect me to train like that? Well, dude, I'm 55. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I have other needs. You know, or you know, so so it's it's so simple when I say it. We all laugh, and yet it happens constantly. I mean, constantly. So that's kind of one of the. Oh, I guess that's one of the things we'll try to emphasize that day. Uh -huh. And so, I mean, I'm I'm incredibly excited. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of, of seeing uh, your intervention light workshop uh, a few months back. I was just blown away. Uh, so anybody who is, uh, you know, has even remotely gotten any value from any of Dan John's work, where you know, come down, spend two days at our place, uh, one entire day with Dan John. All the details you need are right here on this slide. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it more later, but we want to get right into the questions. We have the first one pulled up. So here's how this is going to work. Remember, anybody on here live, we want you to submit questions as we go. If we see a really good one, we're going to give you a free copy of Dan John's intervention book. We will mail it to you. Uh, so please, uh, if something pops in your head, ask away in that little chat box down there. Uh, Dan, this first question here I think is, is, is an interesting question. Uh, somebody asks, how do you know when you're strong enough? Oh, well, you know, uh, that's, it's, that's actually a good question. And, it, and it, I hate to say this, but it ties into my next book. I hate people who do what I just did. <laughs> but I get this question a lot. Uh -huh. And so really, it kind of depends on how you look at, well, okay, you know, when I used to teach moral theology, we always talk about values. And literally, values are just, this is not a very fancy explanation, Values are simply things you value. And from there, you move into other levels of things. But, you know, what's funny is that, you know, the, the very basic one is you should listen to an authority, okay? Like me. I can tell you how strong you need to be at any level, of, and maybe in throws any level. I can tell you the numbers you need to be at. Mm -hmm. Probably in football, I can tell you the numbers you need to be at. Josh Hillis can tell women the strength numbers they need to be at to be at about 19 to 24 percent body fat and hold it for a long time. So the very first way is sometimes you have to ask the authority. You just have to ask somebody, when is enough enough? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because, you know, when Percy Sarity was working with those the marathoners, you know, he expected a double body weight deadlift for a marathoner. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, oh my God, well, you know, they weighed 130. So, you know, I mean, I wasn't ripping on marathoners. God loves everyone. Uh, but, you know, uh, so that would be the first. Well, uh, depending on how far we want to go, and I, and I don't mind, let, can we just beat this up for a few seconds? Yeah, absolutely. Take all the time you need on it. I think this is a, a very, very I won't question. shut up. You know that. <laughs> you know, the next, one, the next one would be something like, you know, deduction, you know, deductive logics. Um, we, you know, we could probably sit around uh, a sport I don't know. And maybe I could have a basketball coach say, I want my athletes to have this, this, and this. And can you help me in the weight room? Oh, I can help you with this. So we make these kind of deductive statements, so to speak, and we kind of come around and, you know, and get kind of – basketball, you can see how basketball would be a lot different, say, football or throwing. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if a kid's seven foot four. Squatting body weight at seven four is a lot harder than squatting body weight at five foot two. Mm -hmm. Trust me, if you've ever seen someone squat who's seven four, you you know I'm right. Oh yeah. So you, you could you know you could make a take a series of statements, combine them. 
Uh, Montaigne, the great essayist, would tell us that we need to go out and do sense experience. We need to go out and slam our face against the wall enough times to figure it out. Uh, I'll just go through the next. I'll, I'll skip uh, two of them and I'll come to this next. The, the, next, the last two I think are a little bit smarter, are, are, are valuable to us. By the way, I think in some cases where we have the, the numbers correctly, authority is pretty good. Mm -hmm. You need to be this strong because Dan John said so. And that's, that, that's not bad, I mean, or whoever says so. But there's this one called intuition, you know, Luke, trust the force. <laughs> Sometimes you just kind of go, it, especially if you're like a six or seven year athlete in a sport, you suddenly figure out that you just don't need to be as strong as you thought you did. Mm -hmm. Stuart Toger, the great uh, the coach, the hammer throwing coach, kept seeing that the uh, Soviets were numbers for hammer throwers in the weight room kept going up and up and up. Bondarchuk supposedly deadlifted 700. I found out later on that the Soviets loved to inflate numbers big time because the Americans would read it and go back to the weight room instead of throwing. Yep. But Toger one year, kind of, he said, I can't do it, I quit. He quit for six months, say, and then he goes out without any lifting and he throws about 90% as far in the high 90s of his lifetime best with no training, no weightlifting. And he kind of comes to the conclusion that what's the least amount of strength training that I can do? Can you see uh -huh. how his brain worked on this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So he kind of he's kind of trusting the force, if you will. Um, you know, uh, you suddenly get that great insight sometimes that, you know, I'm overgunned here and I and I need more there. That was my great insight in my career. I can't keep snatching and clean and jerking more and more and more. I, I got to do something else that'll build my strength without ripping me apart, and that's where the loaded carry showed up. To be mm -hmm. honest with you, uh, I like intuition if if you have the courage to hang around and do it. Uh, and then the last one is the one I I would love to say is correct. Love to say the following sentence I would love to say is true. Wouldn't it be great if we had some real science on this? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, what, wouldn't it be great? <laughs> Except you just I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm wishing for some real science on this. I mean, wouldn't it be great if they actually studied, you know, pull-ups for women and fat loss? It would be mm -hmm. what the, you know, okay, we're going to have a group of women. Uh, we're going to train them on the pull-up five days, a, three days a week, and see if that helps fat loss. Deadlifts and pull-ups. I'm just winging it here. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, when a woman pull-ups does three pull-ups and and can deadlift 275, all of a sudden she looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. We know that's true. By those two numbers are true. By the way, Josh gives me the uh, both of those numbers, and my own experience gives me the two seventy five. Mm -hmm. But we just don't have enough real. What I call, by the way, real science, not, not you know, not blue magic water. You know, kind of. Uh, I, I in the book, the next book, I'm going to use examples. Chromium picolinate. Mm -hmm. Remember that magic dust that came out about twenty years ago that was supposed to make you know just give you lean body mass. And the studies were all askew, you know. Mm -hmm. Real science. We, I would love to say to this, to this good question, by the way, that I wish the answer was, okay, there's been a, what's your goal? Oh, you want to be a better triple jumper. Okay, you know, the American Federation of Triple Jumpers did this great study of 43,000 triple jumpers, and they found out that when you front squat, you know, 130 kilos, 286 pounds, your front squat, uh, your triple jump goes up to, 52 feet, and you, you follow my point? We just don't have it. Absolutely, yeah. So I guess I guess you have to kind of, you have, that's why you need to hang around people who've been there, walked this walk before. The ones I want to tell you I think are best for this example, if you can find someone who's walked the walk before. You know, I, I was lucky. I had guys like John Powell, Brian Oldfield, who I trusted in the throws, and both of them told me that I was too strong. Mm -hmm. I had too much fast twitch. I was blowing through the throws. Seriously, I was too powerful at my size, mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah, girls, I know I'm too pretty. I'm sorry. I <laughs> wish. Yeah, sorry. And don't you love when someone says something like that? I'm just too strong. I'm just I'm sorry. too lean. That, that I like that one too. Oh, I'm just I'm just so lean. You know, I wish I could have something around my belly like you do, but oh, my <laughs> eight pack just gets in the way. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> But uh, I would say if you can if you can have an authority figure you can trust, uh, that'd be great. If there has been some studies that you can trust on real science, 
Um, that would be nice, though. We since Delorm, I don't know if we can trust much. Mm -hmm. And then the other, so those two are great. They kind of come, they sound the same, but they're a little bit different. And then I got to tell this this good question here. You've got to trust your intuition. Mm -hmm. You've got to almost say sometimes. Okay, ex and this helps. Experience helps intuition. I know that sounds crazy. Police officers often say to women if they want to prevent being uh, uh, raped or mugged, trust your you know trust your feelings about stuff. Uh, you've been if you're uncomfortable, you're probably right. It is that kind of same kind of thing. If you kind of say to yourself, I think I'm strong enough, you probably are. Okay. I think um, just to reiterate, there is a a really great piece of wisdom there. You sort of you know hit on it briefly is you know, there's a point where you were looking for the least amount of strength training, strength training that you needed to do. And I think if there's a huge takeaway from uh, at all today, that that, that that might just be it. Oh, I, I think that's the end. I'm not good enough in my articles to explain to people that the best progress I made in my life in the weight room was when I lifted two days a week. But but these people, but the nice, the, the, the readers at T Nation, the readers, uh, the, the people who have the workshop, they haven't ever trained the five days a week, seven days a week, double sessions like I did, to find out that training two and three times a week, double sessions, and then six days a week, you don't, oh, I'm sorry about that, guys, you don't get as strong as simply, um, you, okay, that extra nine sessions a day, <laughs> don't give you as much as you you don't get okay from two sessions to nine you don't pick up what would the math be okay. there's some there's some four diminishing half, returns in there right dan huge amounts so you don't get four and a half four hundred and fifty percent of that so you know if you're deadlifting six hundred pounds uh lifting twice a week your deadlift's not going to go up to two thousand pounds lifting six times a week but we all kind of think that you know we all mm -hmm. And, and it makes sense to me. And I've had other people say to me, you know, I recommend a lot of people this minimal program that Powell gave me. And the reason I like it is it's so similar to what John Price and I did. Uh, day one is bench press and squat. Day two is bench press and deadlift. And people say, well, what about everything else? And I'm like, well, dude, if you back squat hard, seriously hard one day a week and deadlift hard another day a week, you don't miss much, you know. But then the, the same person goes, well, I do the leg adductor machine, then I do abductor machine, I do leg extension, leg curls, half knee, hip, wait, okay. versus squatting 605 for three? That's not the same thing. No, I completely agree. Um, so that takes care of one question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 in all honesty, I think we might have just probably answered about thirty questions in there. Uh, you know, there yeah, yeah. But you you know, it's a great, that, that's why I think this is a, this this question is so funny because it's like, why can't I have a, a three second answer to it? Because uh -huh. it's so it's so layered and nuanced. You know, I mean, you know, that goes right back to question number one: of intervention. What's your goal? Yeah. I mean, if you want to be a woman and get leaner. Then get that 275 deadlift, mm -hmm. uh, get those three pull-ups, and keep a food journal. According to Josh, you'll nail it. Oh, but I, I can only do one pull-up. Okay, well, good. You're one-third the way. I can't do a pull-up. I've never been able to. Well, do a pull-up. You know, you know, just do it. You know, mm -hmm. when I, like I tell uh, my throwers, you know, you need to snatch 250. I can only snatch 135. Yeah, I know. Between one, uh, 135 and 250 is your problem in the weight room, mm -hmm. you know? But that's a thrower versus a woman who wants to be 24% body fat. That's very cool. Um, Same human I, body. Yeah, I think I think that was that was an awesome first question. Um, yeah. Here's another interesting one. Um, I'm interested uh, on your insights of this. Um, somebody asked, "Is there any advantage or detriment to squatting with elevated heels, especially?" if you can achieve a greater range of motion with the adjusted position. So maybe somebody has some ankle mobility restrictions or, or something oh, going on. What are your I thoughts mean, on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm lifting an Olympic lifting meet on uh, Saturday, and I've got boots with heels on them. Um, it, it, I mean, if you want to be able to front squat and overhead squat seriously heavy loads, um, I, well, here's what I found. You can get about 80% of your max in, like, in the overhead squat flat-footed. Same with the snatch. I can snatch barefoot 
and it, yeah, it'd be tough, but I could probably sneak up to an 80% lift barefoot. When you put the heels on and you put the boots on, now you've got that stable lifting platform, and you just you, it's a trick to make you lift more weights. And if you need to get stronger, get those heels off. I mean, I mean, if you need to add load for whatever reason, like for an Olympic lifter, this is going to shock you, but this is they, they, they judge you by who lifts the most weights. <laughs> so, yeah, I know it kind of throws people off sometimes. Mm -hmm. So even though I might, oh, Dan, you're foregoing the flexibility of the outer crucia, the, oh, shut up. I'm trying to lift as much weight as I can. Mm -hmm. Put the heels on, baby. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I mean, it, it is a good question. I mean, if you're like a, a wrestler or something like that, um, or maybe you're an athlete who, yeah. I don't know, if, if you need foot strength for some reason, I, I can see squatting barefoot and giving up that extra, well, I mean, does a surfer really need a 600-pound squat, mm -hmm. you know? But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, again, we, we slide back to, to, to the goal, is to keep the goal the goal here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on the platform, you put on everything you can. I mean, I, I never ta use tape. Olympic lifting meets, I tape my thumbs up because mm -hmm. it just rips you up, man. Using the, the hook grip just rips you up. you got to yeah. tape. Uh, what's funny is I can train for months and never tape my thumbs. One Olympic lifting meet, if I don't tape my thumbs, my hands come off. So uh, you're going to ask me, should I tape? Yeah, on the platform you tape. On yep. the platform you are a belt. But if you're just doing, you know, if you're doing front squats with 95 pounds and you need to belt up with heels, come on. I mean, yeah. Excellent. Um, we're going to, let's, uh, let's switch to a live question now. I'm just going to dig through and find one here. Uh, Joe I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, Swyphen asks, and I think this is a great question for you, Dan, you're sort of a master of the Turkish get-up. He asks, Dan, how much do you feel is appropriate to load with the Turkish get-up? I tend to use it more for movement, patterning, and mobility with very light loads. So I guess he wants your opinion on the on the get-up. You know what? I'll tell you how I load my athletes. Zero. We put a half cup of water. Uh, use a Dixie cup or a plastic cup, and we put it on the fist. I never, in my home gym or with my athletes, we never load the Turkish getup. Now, we might load like a little bit, you know, like a, a drill of the Turkish getup, but for my athletes, we never load it. I, I just can't afford to hurt an athlete doing that. Uh -huh. But I get all the benefits. So you make a fist. If you can imagine, make a fist. And it, it's nice thing is I have a cup of water because I don't want my voice to get grouchy. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take that half a cup of water and then place it on my fist. Uh, on the uh, the knuckles, okay, uh, not the the back of the the hand, not on the palm, and then that will keep. <laughs> trust me, you'll keep that thing at zenith. If mm -hmm. the water tumbles, we laugh and say you got baptized, ha 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 ha. <laughs> but you don't get hurt. And the other thing too is the amount of mental focus it takes to do that is so great that uh, it'll shut up a room full of 15-year-old girls. Mm -hmm. uh, so anything that'll quiet down a room full of sophomore girls is amazing. It's so, a great thing, yeah. Yeah, and then I see, it's in my book, I I Intervention, about that. That is my standard. Mm -hmm. um, I know people get all macho on the web. Oh, I did this and that. No one cares. It's not an Olympic sport. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, you know, a, God bless you for being able to do this big kettlebell or dumbbell or barbell. God, that's great. I don't care. <laughs> but if doing that hurts you, you're too stupid for words. Okay? Yep. So, so for me, I think the movement is genius. The daily assessment of a get-up is genius. The, you know what I mean by assessment? When you go there and go, okay, yesterday I rolled up easy. Today I'm struggling, but only one direction. Well, what happened? I mean, what happened in 24 hours, 36, 48 hours to make you go from being fluid and, and flawless to falling apart? Mm -hmm. Whatever the answer to that question is is more important to me. Sure. Now, now, Joe, and for anybody else on this webinar, if you've never done this challenge with the half cup of water and a Dixie cup of a get up, uh, I'm going to strongly encourage you to, to do so immediately. It's incredibly humbling, very, very humbling. M much yeah. more difficult than doing it with even the, uh, what's the old bouncing the, the, the shoe on there. Much more difficult than that even. Well, well, and also, too, there's a punishment for failure. You get wet. Yeah, you get baptized. <laughs> I mean, and it's funny. People look at, well, it's just water. I know it's water, but everybody working with you knows it was you, too. Mm -hmm. And so what it does, I think it summons up that inner fire of focus. 
mm -hmm. that's just so hard to to coach. How do you coach focus? Yeah. You know, I'm working with these uh, uh, female throwers, and uh, we talk about this thing called arousal level all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I see arousals. If I've talked about this before, just tell me shut up. But uh, arousal level goes from like one to ten. Or eleven, baby. Okay, sorry. Uh, spinal tap. Uh, but you know, maybe a max deadlift. You want your arousal level at probably nine, right? Mm -hmm. Probably. Uh, your arousal level getting massage. You probably want it one or two, correct? Mm -hmm. But what should your arousal level to be? Should be for optimum discus throwing. I'm guessing, in my experience, like a four or five. Mm -hmm. Shot putting be more like a seven. Now, what happens is you go to a track meet. And uh, you get all fired up. You take it, you know, a bunch of amphetamines. You drink 16 cups of coffee, and your warm-ups are the greatest throws of your life because warm-ups, baby, ain't the real thing. And when yep. the competition starts, like sand falling out of the bag, you went from nine to one. I teach my athletes to practice going from nine back to four, and from one up to four, playing with arousal level. So the Turkish getup with half a cup of water is one of the tools that allows us to focus because with the Turkish getup with half a cup of water, you'll quickly discover that there's a, a correct amount of tension and movement in your body. Mm -hmm. There's a correct amount to dial up. You know, you can't leap through the mo movements. You follow? Mm -hmm. So for me, the Turkish get up with half a cup of water is also teaching my discus thrower to be a better discus thrower, not just by the physical movements of rolling and half kneeling, but by the arousal level it teaches you. Interesting, I think that the arousal level you're at doing the Turkish get up with a half a cup of water is very close to how you'd want to throw the hammer and the discus. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's great. What an, you know, it, it, it's an amazing drill. It really is. So, you know, if anybody hasn't done that before definitely get on that immediately next question as well sort of um, is definitely a, a question for you Dan um, you know you've, you've been credited appropriately so with with um, sort of bringing the goblet squat to the forefront uh, so somebody asked how did you come up with the goblet squat now I don't want to make any assumptions here so why don't you uh, sort of just maybe briefly explain what the goblet squat is first and then you can sort of uh, you know talk about how you came up with the drill well, sure. First off, you know, there's there's a drill I've used probably for, oh, it's got to be 20, 25 years now. Years, I discovered years ago the problem. I, I learned to squat kind of the wrong way at first, and then you learn the right way one day, and you don't know what you did different. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason, the, what I did is I reverse engineered what I was doing, and the first drill I used was called the doorknob drill. You can also do this by holding your partner's hands, mm -hmm. and all you do is you grab a doorknob, and you kind of get into that water skiing position, you know, arms are straight, your back, and you squat down using the doorknob or the partner or anything as a counterbalance. Mm -hmm. So what you're trying to figure out is that in, your legs are not under your body. Your body is slung between your legs, mm -hmm. okay? The doorknob drill teaches you that the body is slung between the legs. You get down there, and all of a sudden you're down there with no pressure, with no weird. You, you kind of sit down there, and all of a sudden you go, "Oh, this is what it feels like." Oh, okay. And then you stand up, and then you try to drop back down again a few times, reminding yourself that you're dropping between your legs, not on top of your legs. If you squat on top of your legs, that's what we call accordion squatting, and that's when your knees hurt. Squatting doesn't hurt your knees. What you do hurts your knees. Um, from there, that was great, except when I had 65 sophomores at once. How do you teach 65 boys at once to squat correctly? Mm -hmm. Well, we originally had dumbbells, but later we had kettlebells. And I discovered that we had this. So the drill I first came up with um, well, was the sumo squat. You know, that's where you take a dumbbell and you hold it between your – I'm holding it. Uh, vertically, it's straight down, my arms pointing to the ground, does that make sense? Squ my feet are in a squat position, I'm holding the weight, and I'm going to just take the weight up and then squat down. Okay, it's sometimes called a sumo deadlift, it's more of a squat. Okay, miserable failure. It looks like it's going to teach the squat, it, it teaches a bunch of nothing. Mm -hmm. It teaches a bad deadlift and a, and a rotten squat. Hate it. So, 
I then invented being Irish the potato sack squat. The potato sack squat is where you put your fingers underneath the kettlebell. And this is really important because as a coach in squatting, you have to constantly say down slow, up fast, down slow, up fast. Even the stupid kids figure out not to go down fast with their fingers underneath the weight, okay? Uh -huh. and what it was was kind of cool because if you put your fingers, and I've got my fingers interlaced under right now, and the, I've got the weight in my hands and kind of slung between my hips, I squat down until my fingers just kiss the ground and then stand back up. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a coaching clue that's really important right here. Make sure the in, your arms slide up and down the inside of your thighs while you do this. Mm -hmm. let, let that skin sensation teach the body that it's safe and things are going fine. Uh, so, uh, quick segue. I believe skin contact is a huge Most people miss how important it can be. If you have skin-on-skin -skin contact for like something like a, a windmill with a weight overhead, mm -hmm. you, can put your, you can let your uh, arm slide inside your thigh. You'll be much – even though you're not, there's no weight on it, you'll feel safer and you'll be in a much more solid position mm -hmm. than if you have the arm out in space. So by having the hand slide between the thighs, the body doesn't – you don't seem to freak out at all, okay? Well, now we have the potato sack squat, except the only problem is there was the bottom position because you couldn't really spend any time down there because the weight was on the kid's fingers. Yeah. So, okay, so we've held the ball, we've held the kettlebell by the handle, we've held it by the ball. Well, with the horns was the last option, and so I had the kids squat down, so they're holding it by the horns, and it looks like you're holding a goblet. Mm-hmm. And at the bottom position, this is the whole key to it, you push your knees out with your elbows, and there's, there it was. Now, to come up with a name for it is funny because, okay, my name is Daniel Arthur David John, but Arthur is my middle name. Ah. And, and even as a kid, I was just, I mean, my favorite book is The Sword and the Stone, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Never Let Go comes from The Sword and the Stone. My book, Never Let Go, is yep. from, is, is the first word, uh, is the first law of the hawks. So, now being a, if you, if you like, if you like the uh, Arthurian legends, you need to know about the Holy Grail. I was going to call it the Grail Squat, but I figured no way would anybody ever, uh, so instead I said, well, God, <laughs> and that's why we all know, anybody who hears the story knows I invented it, except that there's a guy in California who not only claimed to invent the goblet squat, but slosh pipes too, which just cracks me oh, up. I think I've mentioned before, yeah. I mentioned before this, uh, I did the article for T Nation on the slosh pipe, and two weeks later, Greg Glassman announced to the world that one of the CrossFit affiliates invented a new way to train called the slosh pipe. Wow. And mm. so this happens, I mean, you know, I mean, everybody knows. It was kind of funny when it first came out, and then the whole thing of, well, you didn't really invent it, you know, uh, somebody, uh, Greg Hanger did. And it's true, Greg Hanger, Lonnie Wade, Mike Rosenberg, myself, we invent all kinds of silly stuff. Most of them will never bear the light of day because it's embarrassing because those are all failures. Uh -huh. um, so that's it. So that's where the Goblet Squat name comes from. So too hot, uh, too cold, part. and then just right, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. And it's funny because <laughs> the Goblet Squat is kind of just right. You know, mm -hmm. Little Red Riding Hood. No, is that Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, okay. yep. That's, uh, that's very cool. That's a very cool origin Goldilocks. story. Yeah, Goldilocks. All right, Dan, let's, let's – uh, uh, Goldilocks, yeah. What are we talking about? Um, all right, now let's go on to the next question. Uh, again, we're going we're gonna to take another one that was, that was sent in before the webinar, but if you're on here live, uh, be sure to get your questions in. We do want to get through as many as possible um, within the hour here. Uh, Dan, this next question is, uh, I believe, another great one. It's it's definitely going to be um, probably answered in a couple of your books. But somebody wants to know, Dan, what is the difference between hypertrophy and armor building? Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, well, hypertrophy is, you know, the, the increase of lean body mass. Uh, well, there's lots of ways to do it. Some are much easier than others. I think puberty is probably the easiest way to do it. Yeah, I uh, strongly suggest you have puberty and all your dreams come true. Um, <laughs> but that's 
but hypertrophy, hypertrophy is in, the increase of lean body mass, and uh, it's usually we would call it bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Armor building is something a little bit different. Armor building is preparing an athlete for collisions, or, or military guy for collisions. And um, I noticed this years ago when we started getting our football player. First, I, I think if you want to play high school football, I think your off season should be wrestling, uh, probably running the hurdles. To be honest with you, in the spring, maybe doing a throwing event, and then in the summer, you know, you take care of some other qualities. But what I noticed is when you first wrestle, the first weeks of wrestling, I've broken my nose, I think, six times. My right tooth's broken. My right side of my face is pretty beat up. Oh, I'm a looker, girls. But <laughs> when I first wrestled in high school, my nose would bleed every day the first couple of weeks. And then it never bled again. And it's funny because I read Frank Shamrock's book years later, and he said the exact same thing. He calls it callousy, that your skin just gets calloused after a while, and it stops... Um, the first couple of times you do Bikram yoga, you get home and your face has this weird flush to it because your face got so rubbed on the t your face is on the towel a lot, you know, and it's kind of just rips your skin up a little bit. I mean, not really bad, but you notice it after a few months. Like if you said, they'll go, oh yeah, my skin used to do that too, and it stopped the more I do it. That's callousing, okay? Armor building is more like callousing, okay? What I began to notice is when I started getting my athletes, my football players, I do a couple of things. One, tumbling. Um, tumbling really prepared them for games as good as anything else. While the guys they were going against were doing curls and reverse curls in the weight room, you know, my guys were doing front squats and cartwheel runs. Well, when game time comes around, my guys have more armor on them. Yeah. So armor is literally the ability to, uh, you know, take a smack. So that was, the, that was the early one. Then we found, it was interesting, um, we got these kind of uh, big boxing gloves, and so we'd go on your knees and kind of punch each other for a while on your knees, and that actually worked pretty good for armor building. It's like, well, because we're hitting each other and we're on our knees, and uh -huh. who knows? Then I found out one time, we were doing uh, double kettlebell cleans. I knew it was and coming. One my, and one of my athletes said to me, Coach, this is what it feels like to be a running back because we run the veer. This is what it felt like, you know, feels like to play a football game. Mm -hmm. What? He goes, well, double kettlebell cleans and front squats is how it feels to carry the ball in a football game. You get this weird pounding. You need that inner that inner tube pressure of your stomach, you, and then you're getting punched on the shoulder at the same time. And so I started thinking about it, and I talked with Pavel about it, and, we kind of came up with a list. I, I still think your one-stop shop is this. Uh, if you're, okay, do two double kettlebell cleans, press it once, do three front squats. That's one. Do that a bunch of times. That, to me, would be your one-stop shop for mm -hmm. armor building. Two, one, three. Two, one, three. Two, I like one, that. three. Mm -hmm. two, one, three. Um, Pavel thinks that uh, thick bar work does that, I, and I tend to agree with that. We found thick bar curls work better for this. Who knows? I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Snatch grip deadlift seem to, too, because the snatch grip deadlift makes that, you know, that area that's, okay, it's between your, uh, on your back, between your armpits. As an Olympic lifter, that's a place where I tell you to break the pencil. Uh -huh. You try something your lats, you break the pencil. Yeah, that's an area where a lot of people get tagged in games. Well, snatch grip deadlifts, for whatever reason, seem to make that area a little tougher. Like, tougher. Uh, again, you see the, the words don't really... My hands are shit going, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. Oh, I know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because once, once you've done these things and once you've played collision sports, that you know makes more sense. Because it's like, yeah, why do thick bar curls help? I don't know, but you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Not one word was uttered in that sentence that made sense, but the athletes could. So that's armor building. Uh -huh. So and armor building might make, I mean, you might not look as good in the mirror after armor building but you can play a football game or maybe a rugby match. So, so perhaps maybe the easiest way to explain it would be where hypertrophy is, is, is building lean muscle mass, armor building is, is building resilience. I like resilience, yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be part of the family of resilience, yeah. I like uh, that. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. Um, now, you can go too far with armor building. I think you probably have three weeks of it in the weight room, probably building up 
you know, and then doing a tumbling workout twice a month is all you need right. in the off season, you know, just to kind of keep your hands on things. But you probably only need about three weeks of it. Once you get into the season, you're getting plenty hit it. You don't need any more. Right. But if I can get you through those first couple of days um, of football practice, where your so your hamstrings don't get sore and you're not constantly in pain around certain areas, mm -hmm. I might make you a better football team because we're not behind the eight ball. Next training question for you, Dan, is what do you think of plyometrics? Well, you know, they've been around. Pat Masdorf read the uh, – he was one of the last people to do the straddle high jump and break the world record. He did them back in the 60s. They've been around a long time. The research on them is clear. Until you can squat double body weight, they have no value. Mm -hmm. so I tell people this all the time. Don't ask, do you squat double body weight? No, then stop talking to me about it. Mm -hmm. Personally, I threw plyos out of training probably 1991 with my athletes. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, I've, since then, I brought them back one time, got a girl hurt doing them, and I'll never do them again. Uh, I don't think, uh, I just, if it hurts, it, it, I mean, they have to be done so, they have to be done with such mastery that it's just really hard to get a typical person to do them. Now I know you're gonna say, well, I, you know, this, these Pac-12 track and field athletes do them right. To be a Pac-12 track and field athlete, you not only have to be a genius, like at Stanford or Cal, I mean, pretty smart kid, right? You also have to be one of the finest athletes ever to stride the planet. So if you're telling me, so if you said that oh, we're gonna do a training program that requires just really, really smart, great athletes, I would say, great, I love it. What am I supposed to do with everybody else I got? Because Stanford has really smart, good athletes. You, you follow my point? Uh, they, have, they have guys that I can say, you need to do it just like this, and they have the courage to do it that way a thousand times in a row. Grandma Tilly, if you have her jumping on boxes, is just trying to get through the ten reps you told her to do. Yep. She don't care how she lands. Then all of a sudden she blows her knee out, now you're at. Now you've injured a client. You've injured an athlete. You're an idiot. Threw them out a long time ago. Very I tend to throw out things. Yeah, I, I, I'm very proud of the fact that I throw out a lot of stuff early. Uh, now, having said that, we know that um, functional isometric contraction combined with plyometrics can really leap you up as a strength athlete. But mm -hmm. like everything, it works for about six weeks and then it stops. So if yeah. you ever if you ever just need to pull yourself, you know, you're you're a good strength athlete and you want to go clean, you know, to another level, mixing functional isometric contractions, oh probably maybe six in a workout, maybe nine. So we're talking about six positions, nine positions on a power rack. It'll take you two or three weeks to figure out the correct load, which is a lot more than you think. Mm -hmm. And then you do leaps after, very valuable. But it's got it's not gonna work very long. Yeah. Great. Next question for you, Dennis. This is, a, this is another interesting one, especially since you have your Olympic lifting meet um, coming up. Somebody asks, are kettlebell swings, snatches, cleans, etc., an adequate substitute for the Olympic lifts? Well, it, it, you, I always pull this back to what is your, what is your goal set here. Uh, I think actually swings are superior to the Olympic lifts for what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a very inefficient exercise. You know, you work like hell and you don't go anywhere. Uh, so it's great for fat loss. Uh, it teaches the hinge. It really stretches out that hamstring, teaching that bow and arrow. So if I had somebody who's, you know, I, I in hindsight, I wish I'd have had the kettlebells when I was an Olympic lifter to really hammer out that hinge position, that bow and arrow position in the snatch and clean and jerk. Um, Better or worse is going to depend on where you want to go from there. Um, you know, I think we talked about killer apps in our last discussion. Am I right? About we did, that? but yeah, why, why don't we just sort of throw that out there again? If if worse comes to, I mean, if you absolutely had to, I, I think the barbell is the king for presses and deadlifts. I think the kettlebell is amazing for swings, get ups, and uh, goblet squats. I think the TRX and the ring family is great for poles. Those are the killer apps of those. Yep. You need a barbell in your facility so you can deadlift and press. I think you need a, a, a kettlebell so you can do goblet squats the best way, 
and swings, and probably, well, the, I like the paper cup thing, but we'll move on. I like the TRX and the family of those things, and the family of rings, because I think it's such a great way to get people to do all kinds of pulls in a fairly actual kind of isolated, beautiful pulling movement versus those snatching rows I usually see at gyms. You know, the you know, guy, sna you know, guy doing rows, but, it, you know, he's using so much momentum, you know? Yep. So, so those are the killer apps. So could you become one of the greatest throwers or football players ever stride the earth doing deadlifts and bench press with the barbell? The swing, goblet squat, and the get-up with the kettlebell and TRX moves, yeah, you'd be pretty damn good. Um, you know, there are many roads to get to where we're trying to get to. Um, now, having said that, what if we threw in snatches and clean and jerks with the barbell? Well, yeah, maybe that, that might really make a leap up, too. Mm -hmm. I, it's, but now, now we're back to the original first question of, you know, how strong do you need to be and how do you find that out? Yep. Um, yeah, I know... You know, I know personally that when I started snatching and cleaning and jerking, um, my throws went up because I just understood what it meant to explode. Mm -hmm. So it's so we got to be a little careful here. This is one of those questions: is it really depends on what do you want to do? I think if you're a Highland Game athlete, I think you gotta, I think you have to use the barbell. I really do because it's really hard. To, to feel that vertical thing of like the caber and the weight over bar, any other way besides with the barbell, I think. Uh, having said that, you could prove me wrong tomorrow, and, not, and just do the the deadlift, bench press, kettlebell thing, and prove me completely wrong. The problem is, if we had a time machine, we could start at zero every time and just yeah. keep doing real science experiments. It'd be awesome, you know. Uh, this, I'm working on one right now. I'm using a design from Stewie, uh, who's on the Family Guy. Uh, I'm using his design to make a. Uh, so I'll keep going back in time and changing how I train and see which one works out the best. Excellent. Next question here. I think I think we have time for a few more. And you know, I I love that idea of the killer apps. By the way, I think that's uh, that's a great way to sort of simplify everything and clear up a lot of confusion. But next next one, let's talk about maybe this will, will be a great way to tie into that. Somebody just asked straightforward, what is the best weight loss exercise or exercise is? Now, you already talked a little bit about the swing and how it's inefficient. Anything else you would add to that list? We know the research is clear. This is one time we know real science. Tie yourself to a tree. Come back in three days, you'll lose 17 pounds. That is what we know works. Uh, <laughs> that's from Chico State University. That's from a nutrition professor. <laughs> Because it's so true. Uh, so for fat loss, we know tying you to a tree is the best thing we can possibly do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I I talk about it in my hands-on lectures a lot. Um, you know, I have a a, a, a bicycle, my uh, Panama Jack Cruiser, weighs 90 pounds. It's got beer holders all over it. Uh, it's real hard for me to go up hills because it's such an inefficient uh, bicycle. It's built for cruising and drinking beer on it. So when I go for a 45 minute to an hour ride, I know I'm more tired than the guy who's wearing the Lycra and the speed bicycle, right? Because mm -hmm. it's so inefficient. Sure. So whenever I look at things for fat loss, you want to find stuff that you're very inefficient. If you're lousy at swimming, swimming's probably a great fat loss workout for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you're lousy at dance, go to Zumba. Um, kettlebell swings seem to be pretty good because you never, even when you get good at them, you still are pretty inefficient. You, you, you follow? Yep. So that's why you, as you get better and better, you get uh, you actually the, you decrease the amount of fat you're going to lose, which is the problem with every study ever done on exercise. People adapt and get better, you know, neurologically. You yeah. know, first neurologically, that's the easiest change you can do, the body can do. But so I know I didn't really answer the question as well as I should, but I guess I guess what I want to get a Cross to this, the person is that the uh, excellence is detrimental to fat loss. Mastery is a problem for fat loss patients. Yeah. They, they they just get too good. Uh, Covert Bailey in the uh, book Fit or Fat had that famous line about if you want to see efficient tennis players, go find two fat guys playing each other because they have the longest arms in the game. They you know they won't move at all. Uh, watch watch a couch potato watching TV. They are totally efficient about not moving at They've all. They've mastered it. Mastery. 
master that. So the better and better you get, the fatter and fatter you get. You know, um, so you, you want to find stuff you're not good at. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's called the fat triathlete. You know, they after after a while, I mean, triathlons will lean you out, lean you out, lean you out. Then you start to go the opposite way. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can read about all when triathlons were popular. That was a big issue that came up. They're kind of disappeared now, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I and mean, they're not like they were, you know, in the eighties. But uh, well, the jogging craze. You know, people go jogging and they got their shoulders would shrink and they got fatter. They became too efficient. You know, if you're running a 23-minute 5K, which is not very good, 25-minute 5K, you know, is that, yeah, is that right? Yeah, that's not very good. Um, and then eat a bagel after it. I can guarantee that bagel is worth, is more calories than you burn in that 25 uh -huh. minutes. You know? No, I think, um, I think that's it. I think that inefficiency, just that, that one word really sort of sums that up. I think, yeah, I think that's great. Um, Next question, I think we have time at least for one more, maybe two. Um, somebody, I guess, is, is looking to gain some strength, and they seem to be comparing three programs here, Dan. He wants your opinion on what do you think about the conjugate method versus 531 versus power to the people? Do you stick with one? Do you cycle them? What's your experience? Well, you know what? I mean, since 531 is the simplest, why don't you start there? Mm -hmm. uh, five, uh, Power of the people is simple, simple. But why don't you start with five three one? Because you know you'll have that you'll have that little variation. You have to squat, which is great, and you'll have the overhead press, which power of the people is just basically press and deadlift. So try five three one. Uh, gosh, people make progress on five three one for years. I mean, they just keep making progress. It's so simple. It's it's. The deload week. People don't do the deload week for. Oh, I don't need it. I, and I, I tell them it's so important the deload. You've got to do week four deload. Um, since it's so simple, run with run with the five three one program. I always tell people on the on on when there's five three one, you do what he says though. Make sure you put in the hill sprints or farmer walks or uh, prowlers or something like that. Don't skip the loaded carry part. Some mm -hmm. people do, and I think it's that's the problem. Huge Power mistake. of the people would be a great experiment after that to see if you can drive up to you know a press and a deadlift after that. Just I, I told Pavel if Power of the People had, had bench press and deadlift, it'd have been the best selling book of all time. Mm -hmm. um, but he went, yeah, but he went with side press. Um, the <laughs> conjugate method, of course, uh, you know that get as much as you can from simple from simple early. Um, linear periodization, if you've never lifted before, you're going to get strong doing anything. Enjoy that wave as long as you can enjoy that wave. Don't get cute too early. Mm -hmm. If you get too cute too early, and I, hey, I think conjugate's great. In fact, I think that's kind of what all throwers do, really. Uh, that's why we get so freakishly strong, is because we do the conjugate method with <laughs> in, in kind of an odd way, you know. Yep. Um, but yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Go always start with the simplest thing you can do. The simplest thing you can do. Mm -hmm. to, uh, leech out every ounce from from that, then get cute. Okay. And um, you know, I want to definitely mention Easy Strength, the Easy Strength protocol. Um, you know, yeah. because talk about simple. Let's see, you know, throw that throw that one in there. Yeah. Um, or, well, and I, you know, I have that little program in intervention called Even Easier Strength, where I just know. give you, where I just say, and people struggle with that. It's like, well, how am I going to get stronger? You know, never. Well, we we still we don't know how anybody does anything. Yeah, so why wouldn't a program? Why not just steal some strength gains by doing it easy? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, like I always tell people, if it fails miserably, so what? Six weeks or twelve weeks. I've been lifting weights since 1965. I, so what if I have spare six weeks? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, definitely want to do at least one or two more questions here, but I just want to remind everybody again. Uh, you know, if you if you've enjoyed this webinar, you've learned something from Dan, which which I do every single time. Uh, you know, be sure to check out Strength Fest. Uh, the little address below. If you want the details on Strength Fest and to save yourself a spot. Uh, you type in your name, like your actual name, like Pat Flynn or DanJohn.getstrong.com, 
and that's where you're going to find more information about everything we've going on. It's, it's an incredible event. Uh, one day is enti dedicated entirely to Dan and his intervention workshop. We have so much going on the second day. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through all the details here. Just pay the website a visit after we finish up here, and then that'll teach you everything you need to know and uh, save your spot there. Uh, Dan, we had a, we had a good a good question here. I think um, will help out um, a lot of people. I mean, this is a, this is a very common uh, theme here. Somebody say their pulls are strong, but their excuse me. Somebody says their pushes are strong, but their pull ups and their chin ups are weak. They can't seem to get one. How how would you go about improving somebody at, at the pull ups or chin ups uh, as quickly as possible? They want to know. Well, I, I'm I'm no expert on this, but uh, it's called grease the groove. Uh, I think that's the best way to improve this. <clears throat> I have uh, I'm pretty strict with my athletes about doing. First off, as a caveat, um, don't ever do pull-ups to exhaustion. I think I think you're crazy to do that. Once you make that elbow irritated, it never it doesn't come around. Uh, I have this thing I call MAPS, middle age pull-up syndrome, and. Uh, once you hit a certain age, if you struggle with a pull-up, you just burn up whatever that thing is. And it's funny because every man over 40 is probably touching that right here. That's what, Yeah, I know, right here, and that whatever the right here is. But what I would suggest is so up to – if you have a pull-up bar in your house, it's even better. But uh, oh, five to six to seven to eight times a day, do, uh, do one, two, or three pull-ups. Mm -hmm. And don't don't warm up. Just hop up, one, two, three. Uh, if you want us, just start with one. You know, six times a day, do one pull up. Over time, go six times two. Over time, go six times three, and just grease the groove of the pull up movement. Uh, that's usually the problem with most people's pull ups is that they just uh, I can't remember, uh, but you know, the, a lot of guys, especially, came from doing lat pull downs. The 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 ability to tense the whole body to make a pull up easier has been lost because you have that little thing on your legs holding your legs down so that machine actually became uh, counterproductive for your pull up ability so I, i'm just I, I pavel's the expert on this he, he always recommends grease the groove it worked for me i had to do that stupid pull of that very important pull up test and all that's all i did is I hit the uh -huh. thing oh i was doing pull ups oh, probably 8 or 9 times a day but only like 2 or 3 Yep, and out of nowhere, boom! You know, um, I was, I really improved that. Yeah, I I mean that's it. There's so much there's so much truth to that. If you just if you just it's it, se it seems like Dan, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if you practice the pull up, you tend to get a little better at it. If you want to be a good thrower, you got to throw a lot, right? <laughs> Runners run, sprinters sprint, hurdlers hurdle. I know, I know, I know. People get tired of me being so flip about that, but it's true. Yep. Um. You know, I think I think uh, we got time. Maybe maybe for one more quick question here. Why don't we do that? Uh, I know we didn't get time to do a lot of live questions, but I promise we give away a book. So let's just give it away to Joe. I know we answered your question earlier, Joe. So if you want the intervention book, email me at Pat Flynn at Chronicles of Strength, and we will get your details and, and give you a pop copy of that book. I wanted to make sure we um we definitely make that happen for you. Uh, Dan, last question here. Let me just pick one right off the sheet that we got. Uh, why not finish with this one? Dan, if you could do only one exercise, what would it be? <laughs> oh, I hate this question. Yeah, um, it's a great one, isn't it? First time I've ever asked. You know, I don't like it. Uh, ask me another one. Uh, one hand presses. Okay, give me another one. Uh, what is the most important exercise to do as one gets over the age of 40 to prevent injuries? Now, that's a pretty good one. Uh, it's funny because it's going to be... Uh, you know, I strongly suggest after 40 that you make sure you've taken care of your butt. So whether it's swings or goblet squats or Bulgarian goat bag swings or whatever it is, you make sure that rear end of yours gets work. Uh, mm -hmm. Farmer walks, hill sprints, uh, those kinds of things. The butt is the foundation of youth, and the, the bigger, taller your butt is, the higher your butt is, the better. Uh, after that... Uh, Boy, sprint up hills and do presses at the top of the hill. There you go. I love it. Love it. Uh, Dan, I want to thank you again for sitting and taking oh. the time to chat with us. Um, you know, it's, it's always a ton of fun. Always learn learn a ton. Um, so, you know, any last words before we say our goodbyes here? Well, no, I just, you know, I do. I really appreciate our conversations. I, I, 
I'm glad you allow me to, to kind of go outside the, you, you allow me to talk. And, and like that thing we did on early about authority and intuition. Well, to me, that kind of stuff is fascinating. I mean, that, I, like, I like to be able to go to that depth on something versus, oh, well, five sets of three, you know. So I really appreciate you guys, your questions. Oh, I mean, the, you know, the honor and the pleasure is, is you know, is, is all ours, definitely. We'll get, love to get another one of these together with you soon. Uh, you know, we're, we're super pumped about you coming down here at June for Strength Fest. So, you know, we hope we see everyone on the webinar there as well. Um, very cool. So, Dan, we look forward to seeing, uh, you know, the results of your Olympic lifting meet. I, I suspect you'll probably be posting something on Facebook. Uh, we'll see. If I do well, sure. If I do poorly, no. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. I'll post them. <laughs> The All fact right. that you know, I've been lifting a long time, it should be interesting, yeah. No, I think I think that's really great. Well, thanks again, Dan. We'll talk soon, okay? All right, you have a great rest of your day. All right, you too. Bye-bye.